Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. I had lived on those mountains for five years before the incidents began. There was nothing notable at first. Little things here and there. Things moved around the property. Animal carcasses left hanging in trees. They started in spring and continued into winter before I left. The big thing that happened that caused me to move out of my home and live back in the city happened one especially cold winter weekend. I woke up early Friday morning, staring up at the wooden ceiling for a bit before I sat up. The fire from last night died down, but the heat still hugged the air like a blanket. I stood and stretched, walking into the living room and adding some wood to the fireplace. I stoked the fire made sure it took again before I made my way over to the kitchen. I decided to splurge a little and make bacon, eggs, toast, and some pancakes. While I was eating, I looked out at the complete whiteout from the large windows. The storm had been raging for a couple of days at that point. The snow itself was halfway up my calves. I finished breakfast and washed up the dishes before I got into my snowsuit and pushed open the door. The blast of cold could be felt down to my bones, shivering. I trudged out, fighting against the snow. Each step felt heavier than the last. It took me a while to make it across the clearing to the small shed where I kept the snowblower. I was trying to open the shed when I noticed something strange off to my right. I squinted, trying to make it out. After a while, I still could not see it clearly and started to trudge towards it. When I got to the tree line, I was shocked to see a deer hanging in the tree. I was used to this by now, but it was never anything as big as a deer. I felt my mouth run dry. Deep tracks in the snow left by a bipedal creature. I twisted the deer, trying to pull it down. I fell back when I noticed a jagged hole in the stomach. I took a few deep breaths before making my way back to my feet. I grabbed the carcass and pulled it down, putting it over my shoulder. I carried it back to the shed, pulling the door the rest of the way open. I dropped the deer onto the butchering table and grabbed my knife. I had spent many days hunting and learned many skills when it came to skinning and cleaning animals. I took care to check on the skin and inside. Once I made sure it was safe, I tied its legs together and hung it up in the corner on a hook. Grabbing the snowblower, I started it up as I pushed my way out of the shed. The storm kept dumping more snow, falling in large clumps. Even as I made a path to my front door, the snow was settling. My thoughts roamed back to the deer carcass. The deep tracks, even in the tree line, looked fresh. I did one more path with the snowblower before putting it away. Grabbing a bit of firewood, I headed back inside. I shook off the snow and tossed the wood to the side. I got out of my snow gear and made my way to the window. I looked out, but I could no longer see the trees, simply a white sheet. I watched for a while, putting on some coffee. The snowfall slowed for a bit while I poured myself a cup. 
I could start to make out the tree line as I took a tentative sip of the hot drink. I leaned forward as it came into view. It was at this moment that I saw the creature for the first time. I could barely make out anything other than an outline, but what I saw was ingrained into my memory forever. It walked on two legs. It was also tall, with thick arms and legs. I couldn't make out what it was wearing, although it looked like it had fur clothes. I watched as it walked along the tree line toward the shed. It was at this time that I noticed he did not have clothes but thick fur. My breath started to increase, watching ever closely as the creature walked up to the shed and stopped in front of the door. It raised its arm and swung it at the shed door. The cold wood easily shattered under the force of the punch. I could hear a roar come from the creature as he entered the shed. The creature returned after a minute. The deer carcass was being dragged from behind. As the creature stepped outside, it looked toward the house, and I could have sworn we locked eyes. It was for a moment, but through the storm, I saw a flash of two dark eyes staring at me. I took a step back, quickly turning to the bedroom and going for the satellite phone I kept on my nightstand. I took it out and turned it on. Walking back to the window, at this point, the storm had picked back up and the creature was gone. I heard the beep of the phone finishing its startup sequence, bringing it up. My heart dropped. There was no signal. The storm clouds were blocking the signal. I tossed the phone on the couch, a fear of what I had seen creeps inside. I have never frightened easily, but the way the creature looked at me, its sheer size terrified me. I walked up to the front door and checked that it was bolted. I slid a dresser in front of the door. There was no way to get down the mountain in the storm, and I couldn't call for help. Barricading myself inside and waiting for the storm to die was the safest option. I checked outside before closing the blinds. I walked over to the couch, kneeling. I reached under and pulled out a case. I opened it to find my hunting rifle. I took it out and loaded up a cartridge. I made my way over to the bedroom, placing a chair in the corner. I sit down and lean the rifle against the wall. Rubbing my hands together, I blew into them. Trying to calm myself down, I don't know how much time passed while I sat there. I could not sit still and kept fidgeting the entire time, waiting for the creature to return. A few times during that wait, I would hear creaks at the front of the house, groans as the wind pushed against the aging wood. Each sound made my heart skip a beat. My thoughts continued to run wild until I eventually passed out on the chair. I abruptly woke in the middle of the night. I was shivering, and I could feel a bitter cold wind blowing through the cabin. I grabbed the rifle and stood up. I aimed it forward as I approached the bedroom door. I slowly peeked out at the dark cabin as the cold wind cut at my skin like a knife. I didn't hear any other sounds other than the wind as I slowly made my way further in. The fire had died down, and so I put down the rifle. I added some wood to bring it back to life. The flames flickered against bitter cold as the light danced against the walls. Leering shadows made it seem as though others were in the room. I approached the table and grabbed my lantern. As I lit it, the shadows faded and my heart steadied. It was at this point when I noticed a large hole in the main window. A stick had crashed through. My breath catches in my throat. Even as the storm raged outside, 
it was impossible for a stick that size to fly through that window on its own. I approached the window and lifted the lantern, trying to peer into the darkness, but all I saw was falling snow. I felt my hand start to freeze against the bitter wind, so I put the lantern down and reached for some garbage bags and duct tape. I patched up the window as much as I could, the plastic rippling against the force of the storm. I put on some soup, rubbing my hands together to warm them, and waited for it to heat up. I placed my cold hands against the heated metal and greedily drank the soup. My eyes went wild, darting at each little movement in the shadows. I got up and went to grab the chair, bringing it out. I set it next to the fire and sat down. My back was to the wall to keep an eye on the whole cabin. I finished drinking my soup and put it down above the fire. Grabbing the rifle, I cradled it to my chest, finding strength in the cool wood. The fear kept me alert for a few more hours until the bright light of dawn started shining through the cracks not covered by the garbage bag. My head started to droop. With the coming day, the tension slowly left my body until I fell asleep. I woke up with a slight jolt. My rifle fell to the floor, causing me to jump out of my seat. I looked around in a panic, still half out of it. It took a moment for me to get my bearing. I picked up my rifle, set it on the table. I took a few deep breaths before looking out the window. I couldn't help but smile when I saw the blue sky. I quickly ran to the couch and grabbed the satellite phone. I fumbled it as I turned it on. It fell to the floor with a loud crunch. And as I lifted it, I noticed a large crack on the screen. I watched in suspense. As the screen turned on, I took a deep breath, lifting it up as I waited for a signal. As soon as the phone connected, I quickly dialed up the park rangers, who had a station at the bottom of the mountain. When I got through, I explained what happened. Luckily, a friend of mine, who I would sometimes hang out with at the cabin when going around, answered. He listened to everything quietly. I finished explaining everything and waited for the response. There was some static before his scratchy voice could be heard. He apologized and explained that they were totally snowed in, and it would have taken a few days to clear a path up. Unless I could come down, I would be stranded. He tried to make me feel better, saying it was probably just a bear. It was easy to mistake these things when you didn't see what I saw. I told him it was not a bear and he said fine, but that didn't change anything. I was still stranded. He told me he would try to get people up as quickly as possible, and to stay inside until they could. After we hung up, I did a quick once-over of the cabin to make sure I had everything I needed. There was plenty of food left since I had just recently restocked, the taps were working fine, and I had a couple of jugs as backup. The one thing I did not have a lot of in the cabin was firewood. That was kept in an overhand about 50 feet from the front door. I walked over to the broken window from last night and peered outside through the small parts not covered by the garbage bags. After a few minutes of looking around and not seeing the creature, I decided to run out and grab some wood. I put on all my outdoor gear and made my way to the door. I looked back at my rifle and chose to leave it. I would need both hands to bring the wood back quickly. If anything happened, I would simply run. I took a few deep breaths before opening the door and stepping outside. The cold hit me like a punch, and a shiver shot through my entire body. I began trudging through the snow, keeping my eyes peeled for any movement. My heart raced. 
My racing heart started to calm down slightly as I reached the overhang without incident. I started placing a bunch of the cut up wood onto a sled that I kept there, making sure it was full before I began tugging it over the deep snow. I was halfway back when a loud crack like a gunshot rang out beside me. I turned and watched as a large tree fell over some 20 feet beyond the clearing. It was not uncommon for trees to snap like that in the colder temperatures, but as though it was a warning. Whilst I was looking in the direction that sound came, I once again saw the creature, the trees shaking as it pushed through the underbrush. I began to hyperventilate, tugging hard at the sled, trying to move faster. I was almost at the door when I heard the snap of a cord and fell into the snow. I scrambled up and saw the creature was now in the clearing with me. I completely forgot about the wood and ran back inside, slamming the door shut. I pushed a dresser in front of the door and sat down in my chair, holding up my rifle. I waited quietly for some sounds that the creature was trying to get in, but as seconds turned into minutes, turned into an hour, nothing ever came. I put down my rifle and put in the last few pieces of wood I had inside. I slowly opened the door and checked back where I saw it before, but it was gone. I took a few tentative steps out, continuing to closely scan the tree line. I thought I saw movement at one point and dove back toward the door, but it turned out to be nothing. I quickly ran over to the wood and noticed deep fissures in the snow that were not there before. I looked in the direction they went. I could not see anything and began pulling the sled with all my strength until it slid the last few feet to the door. I looked around one more time before starting to pile wood inside. Once it was all in, I quickly shut the door and barricaded myself inside. I added a couple of pieces to the fire and made myself some food. I wasn't very hungry, but in that kind of situation, eating to have energy can save your life. I ate next to the fire, my eyes darting between the door and the window. I looked down. My hands were shaking, not from the cold, but from the fear and being tense for so many hours. I curled my hands into fists and got up from my seat. I grabbed my rifle and walked over to my room. I grabbed the blankets off the bed and brought them to the couch. I put the rifle down next to the couch and wrapped myself up. I sat there watching as the sun slowly began to set, the day feeling like a blur. I don't know when I passed out, but the next thing I remembered was being shaken. I slowly opened my eyes in the blurriness. All I could see was brown fur. My mind was engulfed in fear. I tried to reach for my rifle, screaming, but a hand grabbed my wrist. I tried to fight it off, but it didn't let go no matter how hard I tugged. It was at this point that I heard someone calling my name and stopped fighting. I looked up and was surprised to see the ranger telling me to calm down and that it was okay. I stared at him dumbfounded and asked what he was doing there. He let go of me and explained how another storm was fast approaching, and so he and a few others grabbed the skidoos and made their way here. When there was no answer at the door, he came in and found me there. I explained to him what happened, and as I finished, he nodded, explaining how throughout the years others have also claimed to see the same creature. I quickly got all my gear and asked him what they thought it was. He said that no matter how many different people told stories, it always had one name, Sasquatch. I looked down at the ground as we made our way out of the cabin, locking it behind us. We went to the skidoos, and there were three others waiting for us. I recognized them, 
and we all exchanged pleasantries before making our way down the mountain. I stayed at the ranger station for the rest of winter. A few of the rangers went up to investigate, but were unsuccessful in finding anything. As the snow began to melt, I stuck a deal with the men at the station and sold them the cabin to do with as they saw fit. I purchased a small house by the city and never again went back up to that cabin. Visiting the rangers was as close as I got. On to the next one. In Tipton County in Indiana, in June, a hairy humanoid was seen that smelled rank and thickening. It smelled like a cross between decaying meat and vegetables. The same creature was also seen and smelt the next month in the same area. On to the next one. One night at 10.30, all the dogs started barking and the male witness went to investigate. His dog, Zipper, was lunging at a thing that was standing in a low spot. As he got closer, he realized it was a hairy humanoid that was taller than the witness and only 25 feet from him. When the witness stepped out of the house door, the creature looked at him. The head was not ape-like, but not like a man's head either. The creature was furry and had a rank and sickening smell like decaying meat and vegetables. The height of the beast was nine feet and it had dirty hair and stood in a stooped manner with no neck visible. It had long arms and was growling in a deep rumbling manner and seemed to swing at the dog in slow motion for two to three minutes. It seemed confused or uncertain as to what to do with the dog or the situation. On to the next one. Two women were hysterical after a hairy humanoid tried to pry open a window of their house. The hairy humanoid smelled rank, like a cross between decaying meat and vegetables. It was also seen the next week by a male witness in a creek. On to the next one. Bigfoot is not a creature that should ever be approached. I just had to say that because I'll never understand how insane some of these people are that go miles out into the wild in search of them. It's a darn good thing. This species is so rare. Otherwise, we'd have a heck of a lot more dead humans on our hands. My name is Joseph, and I saw a clan of Bigfoot while I was fishing in a Wisconsin town known as Three Lakes. My wife, Lisa, and I have small homes in both Wisconsin and Florida. Like many others, we spend the summer and autumn seasons in Three Lakes, Wisconsin, and the winter and spring seasons in Port St. Luce, Florida. If I had to choose between one or the other, I'm definitely more of a Northwoods kind of guy. However, I realized my frightening encounter led me to want to spend less time up there. I grew up in Wisconsin, but there was something about that experience that made me feel as though I don't know the state as well as I once thought. It was July. Just like any other evening, I went out on my fishing boat by myself, intending to return with a solid catch of perch and walleye. I vividly remember how I was feeling a bit uneasy that night, but I was quick to dismiss it. As far as fishing goes, I usually had good luck when I would head over to an area across the lake where there were lots of lily pads. I turned off the engine and tossed a line out into shallow water while the boat slowly drifted into deeper and deeper water. I suppose you could say fishing has always been the closest thing I do to meditation. For me, there's no better way to clear the mind. However, this particular night, it turned out to be anything but relaxing. I remember how I caught my first fish within the second or third cast. 
that wasn't all that unusual for the evening hours, especially when using night crawlers for bait. But the reason I bring that up is to emphasize that I was still quite close to the shore when it happened. So, I was so startled by the sudden noise that my heart nearly hopped out of my chest, though I still couldn't see anything. Something made the sound, wah, from somewhere within the thicket that was close to shore. It sounded like it potentially could have come from a person. On the other hand, the volume seemed so much louder than what a human's lungs are capable of. Whatever it was, it felt like it was directed at me, and it immediately made me feel as though I was unwelcome in the area. Not long after that first noise, multiple versions of the same noise started emanating from seemingly different sections of the thicket. Some of them overlapped one another, so it was easy to tell that there was more than one of whatever was out there. At that moment, my instincts insisted that I remain still. It was like they somehow knew that there was something extremely dangerous in the vicinity. I felt as though my instincts knew exactly what I was dealing with. Meanwhile, I couldn't form any kind of mental image. It was as I finally decided to walk a few steps over to the ignition that what I can only describe as a bunch of oversized orangutans with human faces stepped out of the thicket. It was so disturbing the way these things had the faces of people but the bodies of animals. However, I could immediately see that the mouth and lips were much larger and wider than what you will find on any person. Also, I felt as though the hands were too small for the bodies. I find that to be strange because it opposes so many of the other reports you come across online. I do believe that there must be a variety of Bigfoot types. Whatever it was that I saw, their bodies appeared to be the same proportions as you see with orangutans, and even the color of the fur was the same. I'd say there were about four or five of them, and it was before I could even put the key in the ignition that one of them was in the water and wading toward my boat. I was still in shallow enough water that the feet of these creatures could touch the ground. As a cinnamon-colored Bigfoot made its way closer to my boat, I could see that its large eyeballs were very dark. It's not that I believe this is the case, but it did look as though it was possessed. That helped me to see why there are quite a few reports out there where people claimed that they had been taken over by demonic entities. It was very creepy. I won't hesitate to admit that. It was as the Bigfoot was nearly within reaching distance of my boat that I used one hand to accelerate and the other hand to sharply turn the boat in the opposite direction of the creature. The propeller must have made contact with the Bigfoot because it let out a horrible scream, and I would later find droplets of blood scattered about the rear of the boat. Once I felt I was a safe distance away, I turned off the ignition when I was near the middle of the lake, and I watched as two more of these creatures were already helping the potentially injured one. It was at that moment that I could tell these things were not the complete savages that I thought. Clearly, they cared about one another, probably just as much as humans often care about their own kind. For what was probably around three minutes, I continued to observe the clan of Bigfoot as they tended to their presumably injured friend. After they returned to the thicket, I waited for a little bit longer, hoping to see or hear something, but there was nothing more. When I returned home, Lisa was shucking corn, so I popped open a beer and told her about what had happened. That was when she reminded me of the times we had heard bizarre noises echoing from across the lake. I suppose you could refer to them as whoops, but I never thought much of them until my sighting. Now... I'm confident that those Bigfoot were responsible for them. I brought Lisa down to our pier 
so we could search for any bodily fluids or hair. That's when we spotted the blood spots near the rear of the boat. We had the local animal control come out so that I could tell them everything. The head guy was a middle-aged man, and there was another much younger guy who seemed to be learning the ropes. Older man didn't say a whole lot in response to my story, but the younger man seemed genuinely intrigued, possibly even a bit shaken. Neither of them claimed to have seen anything like what I saw that day. I watched as they scraped a few blood samples into a small container, and I became overly excited, expecting to hear back from the department about their findings. Now, I know it was incredibly naive for me to assume that they were going to respond to me with any relevant information. They never went out of their way to inform me of their analysis. I had to reach out to them several times. Finally, I decided to head over to the office, and that was when they revealed their BS to me. The lady behind the desk told me that the blood on my boat was from a male deer. She insisted that she must have pulled up the wrong file, and we argued back and forth until I had enough and walked out of there. It's crystal clear that they wanted the Bigfoot sample for their archives, but had no intention of briefing me on the scientific details of what I had encountered that day. The reality is that there are people who are working hard to keep this whole thing on the down low. I have to agree with so many others out there that the Bigfoot species must lead to some bigger truth about this existence. I know a lot of people believe that it's covered up because it could hurt a variety of industries, but to me, that still doesn't add up. For example, most people know that there are risks when camping in the wilderness. There are plenty of predators that could take you out in a heartbeat if they wanted to. Some of you will probably think I'm nuts for saying this, but I think there's a good chance Bigfoot are connected to extraterrestrials if science was to publicize their findings on the species. I bet it would reveal some details that are too difficult for most of us to comprehend. And I do think it would upset many people who are devoted to their religions. All of that is purely speculation, but I so deeply hope that one day we will uncover just an ounce of the truth. It's unsettling to know that another human-like species is running around out there, goes to show that this earth likely contains more mysteries than we can count. On to the next one. I was a recently divorced team leader in the Marine Corps. Being a Marine was all I had wanted to do since I was old enough to talk. I was set into a training cycle with my unit, and we had just finished training at 29 Palms, California for desert warfare training. About a month later, we went to Bridgeport, California for cold weather training. We were taking classes for mountain warfare and cold weather training in prep for being deployed with the 31st MEU, Marine Expeditionary Unit, Special Operations Capable. During the last week of training, we were out on mock patrols, and it was bitterly cold at that altitude. One evening, I drew Firewatch with another junior corporal. It was only a two-hour watch, and the Marines we relieved had disappeared into their shelter halves and quickly fell asleep after the long and strenuous day. About an hour into watch, the other guy with me, who I will call Tom, had to relieve ourselves. We walked a bit away from the bivy area to do our business, maybe 20 to 30 feet into the tree line. Our bivy area was just outside a very dense tree line. As we relieved ourselves, we were just talking small talk, just marine BS. Tom went quiet and suddenly walked past me, mumbling, get the F out of here, or something to that effect. He was in a hurry. I finished my business and watched him at the baby site just sit facing the tree line. I dismissed it because I'm a huge fan of the outdoors. I love camping and fishing 
and I hunt occasionally. As I stood there, I was just amazed at the star-filled sky. The night was crisp, cold, and quiet. As I started to turn back toward the bivy, I had noticed this spot in the tree line where the branches were just barely visible, swaying back and forth. The moon was out and almost full, so I could see a decent distance, but the trees were so dense I couldn't see into it. Why were the tree branches moving? There was no wind. It was only that localized spot. The tree branches five feet to either side were still. Now, this spot was approximately 30 feet from me, so maybe 50 to 60 feet from our bivy site. I began to walk slowly towards it, my rifle off of my shoulder. As I approached about 25 feet, I stopped and watched for a second. I didn't hear anything at first, so I continued moving step by step. And then, after five feet, I froze. I saw the breath feet above my head began to flood with possibilities of what this could be. Was it a bear or a member of one of the other patrols messing with us? I didn't know, but my curiosity had gripped me completely, and I just had to know. I continued walking, and that is when I heard a low, deep growl and breathing. Okay, so now I know this isn't a person and I am more inquisitive and concerned. I can see the long puffs of breath in rhythm with this growling noise. I raised my rifle, the good Lord only knows why, because all I had loaded were blanks to see down my sight, but everything was dark. As I approached about 12 to 15 feet from this area, it stepped out. I froze. It was huge. Given my training in size and distances, this thing was every bit of ten feet. Every bit. Now, to put into perspective, I was six foot one, one ninety five pounds. I was no small guy. I lost all thought of what it could be. I knew instantly. As I craned my head to look up at this creature, I began to sidestep a few feet to get better light on it. Then things got real quiet. Quickly, it went from a bouncer's stance, feet spread apart, about shoulder width, hands at its sides, calm and quiet, to pissed off and angry in a split second. Its stance was like that of the old Incredible Hulk. It seemed to grow another eight to ten inches, and it took another step out of the tree line. It rolled its shoulders forward, upper arms extended at a 45-degree angle to the ground, fists clenched and pointed almost straight down. And then that roar, howl, growl that haunts me to this day. I had just finished urinating. All I had left to do was defecate. And that's what I did. My mind still racing, the what-ifs and the other questions. Do I call for help? Would it matter? I was certain that my team had heard this sound. Heck, I thought the people back at Pendleton, where I was stationed, had heard it. Nobody came. This noise hit me and caused me to stumble backward. I glanced over my shoulder to Tom and the others, but there was no sign of them. I was alone. This thing, at about 12 feet from me, could take a half step, reach its long arms out, and I'd be done for. I lowered my rifle, but I'm not sure why. I knew I only had blanks, but if I shot them, would it run off? I didn't know, and I didn't want to become a midnight snack for this thing either. When I lowered my rifle, it seemed to calm slightly, but it was baring teeth and breathing so deeply that it almost didn't seem real. I began to step backwards slowly. At first, I barely even realized I was moving. Then, a few more steps, it stayed planted firmly on the ground, and I could make out vague details and see its teeth. It had dark, inset eyes, spaced wide apart, and an almost puffed-out look to its upper and lower lips. Its teeth were like a horse's teeth, except there were canines, not fangs, mind you. 
He watched me intently as I slowly moved away, as unthreatening as I could be. After about 20 feet, I angled my body 45 degrees to it and walked diagonally through the snow toward the bivy site, not turning my back to it, but not facing it fully. I looked to see if anyone had stirred around the site. There was nothing. When I turned my head back toward this thing, it was gone. The trees weren't swaying, and I didn't hear any movement. No breathing, no growling. But I'm positive that it was still there. We had asserted our positions to each other, and I had drawn the short straw. I had to leave. I turned and walked to the bivy site and found Tom sitting there eating coffee in his canteen cup. I grilled him. Did you see it? Did you know it was there and didn't tell me? Why did you leave me? He said nothing until I asked him what he saw that made him leave like that. You know damn well what I saw, he said. That was it. So I cleaned myself up and woke the camp. We were moving. I had the radio operator call in our position and give our directions and intended destination. I didn't want my men to end up a midnight snack either. I was a new team leader, but I wasn't stupid either. We silently packed up and moved out. The rest of the night was peaceful, but I kept looking in the direction of where I had my encounter until we were well out of sight. Anyways, when we finally returned to the rear and decompressed, debriefed, and showered and charged, I had heard some guys from another patrol talking about hearing a bear roar up on that ridge. I quickly looked at them and quipped, Are you sure that was a bear? I just got looks from some. Others just laughed and dismissed it altogether. One of the senior instructors gazed at me with this knowing look. He knew what I had encountered, and he just nodded his head, and before he walked away, he said, Right move, and that was all. Apparently, he had been tracking us and watching. I never knew. None of us did. About two years later, I was taking my separations classes, which are designed to supposedly help us transition from military life back to civilian life. I saw Tom in an enlisted club, and we sat together for about half an hour. It was good to see him, and he looked good. I bought a round, and as we raised our bottles to salute old friends, I took a huge swig. I immediately followed that with the question. Tom, back then, out in that last patrol at Bridgeport, exactly what did you see that night? My friend put his bottle on the table, looked around, and in a low voice he said, You know exactly what I saw. You saw it too. Then he followed that with, It's been nice seeing you, Dave. Take care. And he laid a $10 bill on the table, got up, and walked out. I never saw Tom again. I moved to the East Coast, far away from California, far from Pendleton, and far from my ex-wife. I haven't returned to California since, nor do I have plans to. But every once in a while, I think back. Why didn't that creature attack? Why didn't Tom stay back and help me? Identify what I saw? Why didn't anyone get up and check out that noise? Did Tom tell them to stand down? The funny thing is, I don't harbor any animosity towards Tom. And I kind of wish I could bring myself to go back to see this creature who haunts my dreams to this very day. On to the next one. I'm Hector, and I was born and raised in Puerto Rico but my family moved to Miami when I was 16. Miami was a new world for us, and I was able to start taking classes there in photography, which has always been my foremost interest. I worked for many years in the communications business, but I now travel with my wife and dog in an RV, photographing the sights of America. My photos have been in many books, especially those about the national parks. My wife and I both love to travel, and we sold our house to make it more affordable. 
We travel to Alaska three times now, and I have many photos of the wildlife there, including bear, moose, and caribou. But we especially enjoy going on day cruises in the Kenai Fjords National Park and photographing the amazing sea life there, especially the whales and dolphins. I also love to photograph the shorebirds, with puffins being my favorite. We always drive our RV when we go to Alaska, and even though it's a long haul, we kayak and enjoy camping by the many lakes on our way through Canada. But the roads are no place to be in the winter. So my dream of photographing the Aurora Borealis or Northern Lights had always been just a wish. It's also too cold to be camping in our RV in winter when the long nights make the lights visible. But on my 55th birthday, my dream came true when my wife, Sally, gave me an envelope with my name on it. I couldn't believe it when I opened it. I thought it was a card with a little cash, but instead it was a ticket to Fairbanks. And along with that ticket was a reservation with a dog sledder who takes people out to see the Aurora by sled immersing you in the total beauty and silence of the Arctic at night. I was speechless. I not only would be taking photos of an entirely new subject, which would improve my skills, but would be seeing something I'd never seen before. I doubt if anyone has ever seen the Aurora, where I come from in Puerto Rico, and I had no idea how different what I saw would be from what I expected incredibly different. But given my pension for photographing wildlife, it kind of fit me in a way, though I struggled for a long time about what I'd seen. So my trip was planned for February, which is supposed to be one of the best times for viewing the northern aurora. The aurora appears in the auroral zone, a band typically about 10 to 20 degrees from the magnetic poles. Magnetic storms can make the band shift, which is why sometimes you can see the light from lower latitudes, though it's rare. In the north, Fairbanks is one of the few towns along that band. There are other places where one can go, such as Whitehorse in the Yukon, but Fairbanks is the best for potential viewing. The Aurora Australis are the southern equivalent of the Aurora Borealis, and scientists have found their mirror images of their northern cousins. Since you don't see the aurora every night, Sally had made me reservations for five days to increase my odds. My dog sled guide would take me out for one night, and if I wanted to go out the other night I was there, I would have my rental car and could take myself out. The nice thing about the dog sled was that we would be going into wilderness where light pollution would be non-existent. I was to find out that the aurora is an absolutely stunning sight. After seeing it, I began to understand why people would spend so much money planning an entire trip to view it. It's impossible to forget the ethereal and otherworldly beauty of it. Before the trip, I read up a lot on the aurora, but I forgot most of it as it's fairly scientific. I like science, and as a photographer, I have to understand technical things, but the aurora got into some advanced physics, which can be hard to remember if you're not familiar with it. But basically, the lights are caused by electrons and protons that enter the atmosphere from solar winds which is a stream of charged particles that flows outward from the sun. These charged particles cause other particles in the Earth's atmosphere to emit light through ionization. That's about all I can remember, as it gets pretty complex. Well, I was pretty excited, and all I did the entire week before my trip was fiddle with my cameras and read about the aurora on the internet. The University of Alaska has a website where you can see the aurora forecast for each day, and I would check that all the time too. I was excited to see that no matter how much activity there was going on, Fairbanks always seemed to be in the thick of it. 
at the end of my trip, I actually went up and toured the Geophysical Institute on the hill above Fairbanks on the campus. It was very cool to see all their big parabolic radio antenna pointed at the sky. But I digress. Back to my trip, which was truly the trip of a lifetime in many ways. And the Aurora was actually perhaps the lesser of the attractions. Let me explain. Sally and I were staying in Arizona RV Park at the time, so my flight to Fairbanks was a fairly long one. I arrived mid-afternoon, but by the time I got my rental car and found my motel, I really didn't feel like doing much. I drove around town a little, had dinner, then headed back to my hotel, where I went to sleep watching TV. I woke up around 4 a.m. and decided to go outside to see if the aurora was visible, but I didn't see anything, so I went back in and went to bed. The next day, I played tourist in Fairbanks, going to the Museum of the North, where I saw lots of interesting things, including a stuffed polar bear. I then had lunch at the Alaska Brewing Company, which was fantastic. They make a killer pizza there, and their coffee drinks are great. After that, along towards late evening, I met up with the fellow who was going to take me out by dog sled. I guess he would be what they call a musher. He came by my motel to pick me up. His name was Al, and he had his six dogs in the back of his truck in a homemade dog box, where each dog had its own compartment and could stick its nose out. I'm sure the mushers have a name for it, but I don't know what it is. The dogs were huskies, beautiful animals, friendly and eager to go. Al also had a big dog sled tied onto the top of the box. Al told me the word husky came from the word huskimos, which was what early sailors called the Arctic people in general, also known as Eskimos. I don't know if this is true or not, but it made for a good story. We drove quite a ways out of town for about an hour out in the direction of the town of Circle. According to Al, Circle was named because the original inhabitants thought they were on the Arctic Circle, though the actual Circle is still a ways north. After a while, we turned off the highway and followed a road for a few hundred yards, then parked next to a small, steamy pool that Al said was a hot spring. Circle has hot springs too, but it was another hour up the road. It was pitch black when we got there, and I do mean dark. We were lucky and had a perfectly clear sky, and the sight of all the stars was just stupendous. I was wearing a warm down coat with a hood, as well as a wool sweater, long johns, and a face mask. I was also wearing warm snow boots with heavy felt liners. I felt a rush of excitement, like I was ready for anything. The dogs were excited too. Al told me he did this trip several times a week, and taking tourists out into the bush to see the aurora was his main source of income during the winter. I was already getting cold, just standing there waiting, and wondering how long I could go before freezing. Al soon had the dogs hooked up, and off we went. Well... I hadn't begun to explore the concept of being cold for riding on the dog sled created a wind chill that made it even colder. I had no idea where we were going, and where we had been seemed good enough to me, but Al said we were going out to a very special place where we would experience the Alaskan Arctic at its best. I knew this was part of his marketing ploy and what attracted tourists to his tour but the reality was that we were already in the wild, and I kind of wanted to just stay where we were. I was feeling a bit uneasy, I guess, with the reality of how cold it was setting in. Al rode on the back rails of the dog sled, and I rode in the sled itself. We glided over a snowy trail with banks some two or three feet high. The dogs seemed to know where to go, even though the only light was the starlight above us. It was a truly unique experience and reminded me of reading adventure books by people like Richard Pronik, 
the fellow who lived alone in the Alaska wilds in the 1960s, documenting it all with an 8mm movie camera. It was an interesting and yet somewhat unnerving experience to be out in the Alaskan Arctic, surrounded by nothing but deep snow, black spruce, and twinkling stars. And as we mushed along in the silence, my trepidations disappeared, and I felt a sense of deep peace. It was a moment in my life I will never forget. Al mushed the dogs on a bit further until we came to a wide clearing, maybe a hundred feet in diameter, with a small lake in its center and surrounded by more black spruce. These are the short, slender trees that you see growing in the Alaska tundra. They have a narrow, pointed crown with short, drooping branches that have upturned tips. Al told me that the old-timers called them Q-tip trees because of their funny, brushy tops. This clearing was where we were going to spend the next several hours, waiting and watching and hoping that the Aurora Borealis would make its appearance. The forecast had looked very good, and Al was confident we would have an excellent showing. The clearing actually did seem very special, the perfect place for photographing the aurora. I could see now why Al brought people out here. I got my tripod and camera gear out. I was wearing a pair of special gloves Sally had bought that were warm and yet flexible enough that I could still work my settings. After getting everything ready, we sat on the sled and waited, talking for a while, our voices gradually fading into silence. For some reason, it seemed like silence was safer, like there might be something out there we would prefer didn't know we were around. My feeling of deep peace was gone, and I remember thinking at the time that it was odd to now be feeling nervous again, especially since there were no bears around, which would be my normal fear out in the Alaskan wilderness. They were all asleep, hibernating. I asked Al later if he had felt the same feeling of trepidation, and he said he had, and it was a first for him. He said he and his clients usually yacked on and on. He wondered if maybe it was because there might be a pack of wolves nearby attracted to the dogs. Finally, at around 2 a.m., the aurora finally began. I was so excited. I could barely get my camera oriented in the right direction, and I spent the next hour firing off long exposure shots using my tripod. I was freezing, but I didn't care. The lights were stunning, dancing and undulating in shades of pale green and pink, the most common colors. It was truly one of the most moving experiences of my life. I took hundreds of shots. It was now 3 a.m., and the lights were beginning to fade. I knew we should get going as the cold was seeping into all my clothes. I could barely feel my toes and fingertips. Al had given the dogs a snack, and they'd been curled up and sleeping in the snow while I was taking photos. I was beginning to feel sorry for them, though Al assured me they were used to the cold and their coats kept them quite warm. I began packing up my stuff, when suddenly the lights began to intensify again. There was now a red streak running through the sky like a huge drapery, a giant curtain that moved as if some cosmic giant was slowly shaking it. I knew from my research that the red aurora was the rarest of all colors, as it was caused when the electrons strike oxygen atoms at higher altitudes, which happens only during intense solar activity. I'd hit the jackpot. If I could get good photos of a red aurora, I could probably make enough money to pay for my trip. I quickly set my equipment back up and went back to work. Al was a good sport about it, saying we could stay out as long as I wasn't getting too cold. I had been starting to feel a bit sleep-deprived, but my excitement quickly shook that off as I was again energized. High above, towering shafts of light moved back and forth across the horizon, oscillating back and forth in wide bands of crimson and deep magenta. I stood there quietly, 
feeling like a mere speck of nothing in the vast expanse of the universe. Time ceased to exist, and the curtains waved back and forth across the sky, and I then realized I'd been staring at the sky so long that my neck was getting stiff. In fact, I'd pretty much forgotten where I was. I was so enthralled with the beauty of the sky. My attention quickly came back to Earth when I heard a growl coming from one of the sled dogs. The dogs were all on their feet, looking into the trees at the edge of the clearing, and several were now making a low, rumbling growl like nothing I'd ever heard a dog make before. They actually sounded more like wolves than dogs. Al was on full alert, holding the dogs so they wouldn't take off, though they didn't seem inclined to. He was also looking intently into the forest, trying to figure out what had the dogs so upset. He told me later he thought a pack of wolves had come nearby. Hector, Al said, I think we might want to pack up and leave now. I detected a hint of fear in Al's voice, which made me shut it down and begin packing things up as quickly as possible. I had probably taken 500 shots of the Red Aurora, and I knew my odds of getting some good photos were excellent. Besides, I was literally freezing to death, and part of me was wondering about getting frostbite. I had no longer put my equipment away when the dog's growls turned into whines. Al, talking in a low voice to them, turned the sled around in the direction of home. I could see that the dogs were very antsy, and it was all he could do to hold them back. I had no idea what was going on. Do you think there are wolves out there? I asked. Maybe, he answered, staring off into the trees. Maybe something else. My eyes followed his, but it took a while to see into the darkness, as I'd been staring at the red lights in the sky for some time. The entire landscape had a reddish tint to it, much like you would see during the first light of a brilliant red sunrise or the last minutes of a crimson sunset. The lake was reflecting so much red that it melted into the sky at its far shore, giving it an eerie, endless appearance, like a giant cosmic infinity pool. Trying to make out what Al was seeing, I thought I saw movement in the dark spruce, but it was too hard to tell. There was no wind, but it seemed like several of the trees were swaying. The dogs were now acting terrified, trying to hide behind each other, tangling up in their harnesses, staring hard into the trees. My eyes became more acclimated to the dark, and I could now see actual movement. Soon, I could see faint red light like the glowing ends of cigarettes. Why would someone be way out here in the bush, standing around in the freezing cold, watching us and smoking? It made no sense. Next, I could hear the sound of sticks hitting against sticks, sounding kind of like when a snare drummer hits the rim of the drum, except there were several drummers, and to top it all off, a low humming noise started up. Al sounded frantic. Get in the sled now. I was mesmerized and couldn't move. Get in, yelled Al, as the dogs bolted, heading back down the trail. The sled jerked along behind them, with Al holding on for dear life. I leapt for the sled, but I was too slow. It slid quickly and silently out of my reach, and I watched incredulously as its dark form quickly glided down the snowy trail we'd come in on. A deep, innate fear took hold of me. A fear I've never felt before or since. A fear much like a deer must feel as it feels the claws of a mountain lion clamp onto its back. The clicking noise was louder, and I knew whatever it was was coming towards me, leaving the trees and coming into the clearing. The humming was also louder and somehow deeper. I tried to run, but my heavy boots made speed impossible. Instead, I post hold through the trail into snow up to my knees and fell forward, smashing my face into ice crystals. 
the sound of heavy footsteps crunching in the snow came up right behind me. I was afraid to look up, sensing immediate danger. As I pushed myself up from the snow, I must have somehow jammed something against the cell phone in my shirt pocket, for it started playing one of my ringtones, a piece by Beethoven. I was startled by how loud it was as the song played over and over. The figure next to me quickly turned and walked away, moving remarkably fast through the deep snow. I managed to get out of the snow and upright, continuing down the snowy trail at a desperately slow pace, sinking into the snow over and over. At least I didn't fall again, though keeping my balance was difficult. My ringtone played on and on, and to this day, I can't stand the sound of Beethoven's Fifth, even though it may have saved my life, as I have bad associations with it. Tediously, half walking and half hopping, it seemed like it took forever to leave the meadow and get back on the path through the trees. The forest, which had felt foreboding before, now felt somehow sheltering, as if maybe it would provide a place to hide. As the clicking gradually became more distant, the shock of being left in the Alaskan wilds alone on a blistering cold night began to set in. I just couldn't believe it. I finally turned off the ringtone, not wanting to run my battery down. I tried to dial 911, but I had no signal. Walking through the deep snow was hard work and I began to warm up some, my feet and hands now tingling. I knew I had several miles to go before I would get back to the hot springs, and I doubted I could make it, even if the strange creatures behind left me alone. I began to picture Sally's face when she got the call saying I had died in the Alaskan wilderness. I knew she'd feel guilty, like it was somehow her fault and I suddenly felt a desperate need to somehow get the message to her that it wasn't. Did I have any paper in my pocket or camera case? I then remembered that my camera was on the dog sled, which was probably back at Al's pickup by now, considering how fast they'd been going. Besides, even if I had something to write on, no pen on the planet would write in that bitter cold as the ink would be frozen. I trudged on and on, sometimes seeing dark forms in the trees next to me, and sometimes hearing the sound of heavy footsteps crunching nearby in the frozen snow. But I no longer heard any chattering or humming. After a while, I went from sheer terror to a more haunting kind of fear, the kind that tells you you might die, but it will take a while because maybe you're being stalked. I suspected that my greatest danger was actually the cold, but at least hypothermia wouldn't be as painful as some kinds of death. I would just stop going, sit down, and go to sleep. Would the wolves feast on me, or maybe the strange creatures that still seemed to be following? After a while, I began not to care. I could feel my core body temperature falling. I was still desperate to somehow convey to Sally that it wasn't her fault and that I loved her, and I think that's what kept me going. I knew I was delirious when I suddenly saw a strange sight on the trail. It looked like a dog sled, stopped in the trail waiting for me. I tried to hurry, but ended up falling instead. I no longer had the strength to pull myself out of the snow, and I knew I would soon die. But now, two strong arms were lifting me from the snow, and I knew it was Al. Hurry up, Hector. Get in the sled before the dogs take off again. He dragged me onto the sled, and the dogs were soon running, the sled tipping dangerously when the trail turned. I could hear Al yelling and cussing at them to slow down, but they kept on. They had to be exhausted. When they suddenly stopped, I knew we'd reached Al's truck. Al helped me get into the cab where he started the truck and turned the heater on high. He then unhooked the dogs and put them in their boxes in the back, then loaded the sled on top, working quickly in the bitter cold. He didn't say a word until we were back on the highway again. I could see he was shaking, even though the cab was now warm. 
and I knew he'd been just as cold as I was. It seemed we both barely sidestepped death. I'm really sorry for leaving you back there, he said. The dogs bolted, and I couldn't stop them. They totally ignored me, even with the sled brakes on. They just dragged it forever until they got tired. Whatever was back there, it scared them to death. All I could do was wait and hoped you came out. As there was no way they would turn back, I nodded. It was okay. Too tired to talk. Finally, I asked, is my camera okay? Yes, it's behind the seat. We were soon back in Fairbanks. Al dropped me off at the motel. The outside thermometer by the office read minus 42 degrees. You'll be okay? Yeah. Yeah, I'm fine, as long as I don't forget my camera. I have a feeling those photos will be worth all this. I smiled, trying to show him I wasn't going to hold any grudges, especially about something he had no control over. I can refund you your money if you want, he added. No, it was worth every penny, Al. It was the trip of a lifetime, in more ways than one. I held out my hand and we shook, neither of us mentioning what we'd seen. After he left, I crawled into bed, totally fatigued, both mentally and physically. I reveled in feeling safe and secure, aware of how lucky I'd been, and now keenly appreciating everything I had. The next morning, I downloaded my photos with awe. They turned out great. I was ready to go home. I called Sally, happy to hear her voice. I didn't tell her about what happened. I had been in Fairbanks for two nights by then, and I had three left. I wasn't sure about what to do, as I just wanted to leave and go home. But if I did, it would cost to change my ticket, and I'd already paid for the motel, so I decided to stay. Maybe I could get more photos of the Aurora, some violets and blues, assuming I had the courage to go out in the dark again. I did more sightseeing around town that day, going down to the Chenna River and looking at the riverboat, as well as finding a jewelry store where I bought Sally some pretty white earrings shaped like polar bears. That evening, I decided to try again for the Aurora, as the university webpage said we were still in the middle of very high auroral activity. There was no way I was going out toward the hot springs again, so I decided to go up on the Chenna Ridge above the university. It was close, and there were houses up there, so I didn't figure I would see anything weird. I went out around 1 a.m. and pulled off on a long drive that went back to a nice house. I stayed in my car until I finally saw the lights appear overhead. Then I got out and set up my equipment. I did get some nice shots, but I have to admit that my fears overcame me. I started seeing shadowy figures everywhere, and the horror of the previous night came back in full force until I had to leave. I suddenly lost interest. I was tired and I decided to get a good night's sleep, then return to Arizona the next day, even though I'd have to pay for the flight change. Besides, it was too cold and I hadn't really recovered from my night into the wilds. I just didn't have the stamina to stay outside, looking at the night sky, beautiful as it was. I was soon on a plane home, very happy to see Alaska in the rearview mirror. And I can't tell you how happy I was to see Sally again. I basked in the Arizona warmth for a few days, thinking of my trip. One thing it taught me was that there are many things out there we don't know about or understand. I feel that Bigfoot is one of these. Lots of stories portray them as being simply curious and not really dangerous, though territorial. But there's one aspect of the Bigfoot that I got a glimpse of that night, an aspect that people tend to forget. If Bigfoot really is a member of the ape family, as we humans are, then it stands to reason that it has a capacity for doing harm, as most apes are capable of doing very bad things. I'm not saying Bigfoot are dangerous, just that the jury's out. 
I'm convinced that the Bigfoot that I saw that night could have easily harmed me if they'd wanted, yet they didn't. Why, I'll never know. Maybe it was the uncertainty of hearing my cell phone that made them pause. Maybe they would have ripped me to shreds otherwise. I just don't know. How do I really know they were Bigfoot since all I saw was shadowy figures? Well, when I got home, I downloaded all my photos onto my large monitor and studied them. As I scanned through them, I realized I'd photographed the strange figures without knowing it. There among the shapes of the black spruce stood half a dozen shadowy figures. Their glowing red eyes stood out clearing, lending the scene a weirdness that goes beyond words against the background of a blood-red sky. And it appeared that a couple of them were holding sticks high into the air, possibly the source of the clacking sounds I heard. As I zoomed in on the photos, it became clear what they were. They fit the description perfectly a Bigfoot. Broad-shouldered, conical heads, large, bulky sides, and glowing eyes. Even though the images were dark and shadowy, it was obvious. I was stunned. I knew I'd been trying to repress the memory, but it's hard to ignore photographic evidence. And there it was. Proof that Bigfoot exists. Proof enough for me, anyways. I thought about it for many days, then decided not to share the photos with anyone. Not even Sally. Something made me reluctant to want to show them to anyone. I don't understand why, but I feel a deep need to keep it all to myself. Of course, Al knew, and he was free to do whatever he wanted, but I somehow knew he wouldn't say it either. I kept the photos for a good month, then erased the figures in Photoshop, deleting them, leaving only the blood-red sky. I decided I didn't want Sally to ever see them. I had no interest in ever discussing it again with anyone. And really, you are now the first person I've ever told this story to. My decision brought me peace, even though I can still sometimes hear that clattering noise when the windows blow just right. Maybe it's just the leaves blowing across the roof of our RV. It'll always bring back a memory. A memory I'll never forget. A memory of truly the most unforgettable things I've ever seen. Glowing, blood-red eyes under a glowing, blood-red sky. On to the next one. In Elizabeth Lake in Summit County in Utah, three Bigfoot were watched for 10 minutes as they played in a meadow by Mr. and Mrs. Robert Melka and Sergeant and Mrs. Fred Rosenberg. The creature also ran around at high speed. On to the next one. This happened on a hunting expedition in Farmington Canyon in Utah. There were four in the hunting party. Everyone was away from camp hunting. There are two lakes where this occurred. The sun began to go down to set. It was an archery hunt, so normally you would sit wherever you were because that's when the deer or elk come out. Every hunter's hope are that he is going to see something before it gets dark. On this particular evening, nothing seemed to come out from the landscape. So I proceeded to move slowly back down the trail toward camp, which was set up just below the lakes. It was too dark now to see any of my other hunting companion. No moon was in the sky, just stars. I had positioned myself above the upper lake. I knew the area quite well. As I proceeded to go back, I had to cross a little creek that came out through a marsh below the upper lake. But being that it was dark, I couldn't really see the trail. But I could hear the water gurgling in front of me. As I came to this spot in the trail, I knew I had to make the right moves or I would end up in the water. I sat there trying to adjust my eyes to see where to make the next step. While I was standing there for a few seconds, I started to hear a low, growling noise. I have never heard a noise like this. I never believed in Bigfoot. When I heard the noise, 
I thought it was one of my companions playing with my mind hiding in the bushes. So I not very loudly muttered under my breath, Steve, Mike, is that you? Not getting any answer, I could hear the trees start to thrash and that noise came back again with a deeper growl, almost like a moan, low in pitch. As I stood there, it seemed like an eternity, but was only about five minutes. I knew I had to be making a move. I had to take that trail that led through the bushes. With my bow in one hand, I held my breath and jumped to big leaps across the creek, landed half in the water, and yelled out a couple of loud words and ran through those bushes. I never stopped until I reached camp. When I got back to camp, there was nobody there. So I put my bow against the tree and proceeded to get a flashlight out of the tent. Within a few minutes, everyone was back at camp. We all talked about what we had seen and what we had heard. Then I talked about what I had seen and what I had heard, and everyone had a hard time believing my story. They thought I probably heard a cougar, but I've been hunting for many years, and I know a cougar when I hear one. About half an hour later, another friend pulled up in his truck. He was going to spend the night with us. He brought his dog. We fixed something to eat and then crawled into the tent. We told a few stories and then drifted off to sleep. About the middle of the night, the dog started to growl in the tent. It started to growl at first, and we tried to calm him down. It was pitch black outside, except for the stars in the sky. The dog's growl began to pick up. We tried to hold the dog down. Then it started to growl and bark. We finally got the dog down on the tent floor when we could hear something outside the tent. Something then brushed the side of our tent. The dog immediately jumped up and started to bark. The dog barked for about 30 minutes, and then it seemed to settle down. The area where we had pitched the tent was in tall grass. There wasn't much dirt or barren trails. The next morning, we inspected for tracks to find out what it was, but the grass was so tall that we found nothing. The noise that I heard that night has made me a believer of what lurks in the woods. The first was at 8.45 p.m., the second was at 2 a.m. It was heavily wooded, thick underbrush with two small lakes nearby. On to the next one. Eight hikers spot elusive Bigfoot in high unitas. Two North Ogden men and six young companions said today said they watched a gorilla-like creature in the high Unita Mountain that matched reports of Bigfoot. Jay Barker, who has hunted big game animals for years in the area, said the creature was estimated at being 10 feet tall. He said that it was covered with a white mantle of hair over its shoulders and halfway down its huge body. The lower portion of the creature was dark colored, said Mr. Baker, who said after it spotted his party, it ambled off on its hind legs. Mr. Baker and his two sons, Brett 12 and Danny 6, had hiked to the top of the ridge between Pass Lake and Cuberant Basin at the head of Weber River drainage. They reached the top of the ridge at noon Monday and made contact with Larry Beeson and his three sons, Scott 14, Michael 11, David 5, and Paul 14. About that time, they looked down upon a small alpine lake about one half mile below them and saw the creature standing on its edge. At first, Mr. Baker thought he was looking at an elk. Then the creature turned to look up at the party after a couple of the boys had knocked rocks loose that rolled. What are we looking at? said an amazed Mr. Beeson as the creature turned and walked off on its hind legs. Mr. Baker said, the distance was too far to get a good look at the creature's face, but he said it moved through scattered trees, turning its head back to look at them from time to time. He said they watched it for some four minutes while it covered about one half a mile through the scattered trees and then disappeared into heavy timber. Startled and almost dumbfounded, the group stared. That thing is standing on two legs, said one member of the amazed party, as they looked, 
Mr. Baker said the party went down to where they had seen the creature after it disappeared. They found paw-like imprints in the earth, but the ground was too hard and dry to leave a clear imprint. He said the paw mark was huge and resembled that made by a palm and toe. The party followed the path of the creature to the timber and found other scruff marks on the rocks and in the dry ground and grasses. Mr. Baker said that the group thought better about following the hairy creature into the heavy timber. Excited and unable to sleep, Mr. Baker said he and his boys were too tired after their experience to make the return trip of over six miles back to their camper near Path Lake. They spent Monday night huddled about a campfire at Fish Lake near where the creature had been seen and came out Tuesday. Mr. Baker estimated the elevation of the small lake where the creature was seen at about 12,000 feet. It was above the timber line. He also said a sheep herder in the Gold Hills area below, Arlo Fawcett of Roy, reported he had been unable to get a sheep to stay in the area where the creature was seen. Mr. Fawcett reportedly said he would take his sheep into the area to graze and they would beat him back to camp apparently filled with fear. The herder also said, it's the first summer this has happened. It's also the first summer that he has failed to see or hear any coyotes in the area. Utah wildlife officials informed of the incident said they will ride into the area on horses to check the area. Jerry Dalberg, conservation officer, Northern Region Utah Division of Wildlife Resources, when informed of the creature, said the description fits a grizzly bear to a T, all except for walking upright for such a long distance. Officer Dahlberg says he plans a horseback trip into the area over the Labor Day weekend. Mr. Beeson said when they reached the area where the hairy creature was seen, they found the carcass of a rabbit that had been completely skinned by a human and partially eaten. On to the next one. In Wasatch County in Utah, Mike and his younger brother, Lynn, had gone fishing. They had been in the area many times before with their father and other family members. They arrived at their intended campsite at about 7.30. They both had noticed once they entered the canyon, they saw no more wildlife, deer, birds, or anything. Mike remembers having an eerie feeling from the very moment they started down into Timber Canyon. He recalled hearing no noises and commented to Lynn about this and the weird feelings he had of something or someone watching them. They had forgotten worms, so both went out into the willows and were digging worms, all the while feeling like something was watching them. Mike said the hair on the back of his neck was standing on end whenever he looked around to see if they could see anyone watching them. They returned to the truck, lit a lantern, and put it on top of the truck and proceeded to light a fire to roast a hot dog on. His brother and he were sitting on a log, and he noticed his brother had opened a beer and was not drinking it, and was just staring at something, and had ceased to talk to him. He looked in the direction his brother was looking, and saw a Sasquatch trying to sneak from off the road to a clump of willows, and then proceeded to peer at them by holding the willows off to one side, and leaning over so the Sasquatch could get a good view of them. Mike was so shocked he lost his balance and fell from the log and, in getting back up, noticed the Sasquatch creeping behind the willows moving to the west and south. Mike and his brother then lost visual sight of it and could hear very loud thrashing noises of the Sasquatch going through the creek and willows and up the canyon to the west and south of the campsite. Mike said, he did not smell anything and figured it was because of the smoke from the fire. Mike estimated the whole sighting and noises lasted two minutes. His younger brother wanted to stay there and sleep in the camper shell, but Mike was impressed very strongly to leave and get out of there. It was dusk and almost dark on a moonless night. It was clear weather. It is a narrow canyon with a small stream in it with lots of willows and beaver ponds. There were timbered north slopes and sage and juniper on the south slope. On to the next one. 
on the Monte Cristo Highway near Ogden in Cache County in Utah. I lived in Utah and my wife and kids went hunting in the mountains. We set up camp and we were a couple of days early for the season to start. My wife and I decided to go out and scout the area. We were going down a ridgeline and out stepped an animal. This time, I'm a witness of seeing the creature. By the time we made it down to where it was, it was gone. Later that night, it snowed. During the night, I heard the animal going around our tent. The next morning, there were huge tracks going around our tent. We never seen or heard the animal again. There was a spring, which was the only water for a few miles. It was early morning, the first time, and about two in the afternoon the second time. I now live in Washington. At work one day, we had a new hire, and we got to talking, and he was from Utah. I told him that I lived in Utah for a while. He asked if I hunted or fished. I told him that I hunted up on Monte Cristo. He told me that there were several sightings of Bigfoot up there. On to the next one. One Graves County witness alerted by the sound of breaking limbs one night in Mayfield, Kentucky, claimed that he saw a large, hairy, black Bigfoot with small, glowing red eyes. Again, the terrified witness fled when the creature started to approach. But then, who can blame him? It smelled bad, too, the wife later reported. One evening about dark, my husband was taking tree limbs into the woods behind our house to discard them on an old dozer pile. He heard a noise that he assumed was a deer running through the underbrush. About this time, according to the wife, he noticed a foul odor like something dead. Looking out through the dense trees and brush, he saw a huge, dark-colored, hairy creature approaching him. It was bigger than him, the wife stated, and he is six feet tall, 180 pounds. At first, he thought it was a bear, she said, despite the red-colored eyes, until he realized that there are no bears in that part of Kentucky. Badly frightened, he came running out of the woods. He told me what he saw, and that he wasn't going back to see what it was. I have never seen my husband that scared before in my life. She summed up her husband's description of the beast as a large, hairy, black animal with long hair and glowing red eyes that smelled really bad. The incident allegedly took place in a wooded area containing a gravel pit and a large lake. The animal apparently made no sounds except for the underbrush crushing and snapping beneath its feet. Again, we hear testimony describing the sound of loudly snapping, cracking limbs wherever the creature walks. One might think that such a huge beast would be easy enough to track by simply following the trail of broken trees and limbs. But such is not the case. Such destruction of local fauna on that scale, strangely, is never seen when the area is visited later, leading one to theorize that the often reported tree breaks may be an auditory phenomenon and not a physical one. Graves County is one of the state's largest counties, and Mayfield, the county seat, has a population of just over 10,000 people, at least four more of whom would join the list of Graves County Bigfoot Witnesses. Years later, in October of 2008, four juvenile witnesses claimed to have had the most awesome yet intense encounter ever while out shooting airsoft gun in the woods near Simsonia. It was just after dawn when they arrived. It was early morning, and it was a group of us not expecting anything like that to happen, one witness later said. We were patrolling the woods, practicing for airsoft wars. Chanley, a kid in our group saw something and brought our attention to a moss-colored beast. We immediately pulled up our scopes to get a better look. One of us dismissed it after firing near it a couple of times. We then reloaded, and when we were leaving the location to go deeper into the woods, one of us noticed that it had moved to a new location. We then hauled our butts out of the woods and re-examined the area later. We found nothing. 13-year-old Jordan F., along with a cousin and two friends, observed this creature in October, when he was 11 years old. 
The three were up early that day, just after dawn, exploring some wooded property in Graves County near Simpsonia, owned by his cousin's parents, and were shooting their airsoft rifles when his friend Cheney first noticed the thing positioned in the brush about 25 yards, 75 feet from them. He yelled, look, and the other two boys turned to see it. Through their rifle scopes, they could see that it was a large, hairy, man-like creature. Jordan said it was covered with hair, which he described as moss green. The creature also had glowing red eyes, even though it was daytime. It appeared to be crouching down in an ape-like fashion, he said, with its waist resting mostly on one leg. One of its arms was stretched out in front of it, knuckles to the ground. All three noticed a strange smell like a mixture of rotten meat and urine. The group, in true Kentucky fashion, fired their plastic bullets at the object, and the thing moved around a little like it was irritated. As they were about to go into a patch of woods, they noticed that the object had moved to a different location. Oddly, it was only then that the youth became alarmed and decided to beat a hasty retreat back home. When they examined the area later, they could find no tracks, hair, or any other trace of the creature. Jordan described the terrain as being a small, thickly wooded valley near a swampy area with nearby creeks and streams. Interestingly, Jordan and his cousin, Clayton, seem to be magnets when it comes to unexplained phenomena. In addition, they had also seen a dark figure up in a tree, which he described as monkey-like, thin, and covered with mangy-looking fur on several separate occasions, in both McCracken and Livingston counties. On to the next one. Another Bigfoot-type creature was seen by a child in Litchfield, Kentucky, near Nolan Lake on Interstate 65. When I was a kid, my grandparents had a little bitty camper at a campsite at Nolan Lake, she later claimed. One summer, my father took the family, me, my sister, and mother to my grandparents' site for a little vacation. One evening, as it was becoming dusk, I remember standing inside the camper looking out the screen door at my father, who was cooking at the grill. The campsite sat at the top of a hill in a wooded area. The woods consisted mostly of old-growth deciduous trees, so there weren't really any evergreens or shrub-type trees like cedars which could really block your view. I was looking out the door at my father, who was on my left, and eventually, out of boredom I guess, I ended up scanning the right and down the hill into the woods. I remember seeing about midway down the hill something that caught my eye. You know how when you think you see something and in a split second your mind says, did I just see what I thought I saw? Well, that's what happened to me. Midway down the hill, partially hidden behind a tree, was this man thing. I could see his whole head, his right shoulder, and part of his leg coming out from behind the tree. It was grayish brown, and he was looking right at me. I looked away thinking I had to be imagining it, but when I looked back, it was still there. And I had no problem picking him out from the trees. At that point, my mother, who was cooking at the stove behind me, said something to me, and I turned around to talk to her. When I looked back outside, down the hill, it was gone. I kept looking through all the trees, but I couldn't find him. What I saw was big and burly, and it didn't make any sense that I can remember. It had a big, squarish head, kind of blocky with rounded corners, that looked like it sat right on its shoulders. I really don't recall seeing a neck. I could see a massive shoulder and a thick bicep. I could also see its chunky hip and a good portion of its thigh down to about its knees. All the rest was hidden behind the tree. The witness claims that she gets cold chills when she thinks of the figure she viewed all those years ago. She didn't tell her parents of the event because she was afraid they wouldn't believe her. The creature, according to her, was much taller than a man with shaggy gray-brown hair covering its entire body. I hope you enjoyed those encounters. And if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell 
and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!